Hey, I think I'm on. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Mark Bennett, the Research Manager at the Royal Armouries, and welcome to the 10th talk in our Winter Lecture Series. The Royal Armouries is the UK's national collection of arms and armour, operating from three sites across the country. Our main base in Leeds, our historic home at the Tower of London, and a Victorian fortification outside Portsmouth, where we display the bulk of our artillery collection. If you'd like to uh, keep tabs on our sites reopening, find out about future events, or get closer to the collection through our online catalogue, please go to our website, which is royalarmories.org. Today's lecture is part of a series exploring topics related to arms and armour across the centuries, although today we come at it from a somewhat different angle than normal. As a museum, we're charged with the collection of some, uh, with the with the preservation of some incredibly beautiful and historic objects. Whether it's the horned helmet gifted to Henry VIII, the Tula garniture created for Empress Elizabeth of Russia, or the elephant armour purchased by or gifted to Lady Clive in India. Keeping these objects in condition so that future generations can enjoy them requires the high level of skill and careful due diligence that we're going to see today. Now, our speaker has actually pre-recorded their talk just in case of internet connectivity issues. The sound will be as loud as I can make it, so be sure to turn it up at your end if necessary, and apologies if I deafen you when we come back in. However, they are joining us for the event and there will be the opportunity to ask questions after the talk. The usual drill applies. If you're watching on YouTube, please type your questions in the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. If you're watching via Zoom, you'll find a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen where you can type questions. As always, while I can't guarantee to get through them all, I'll cover as many as I can. With the necessary preparation out of the way, therefore, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Lauren Piper. Lauren started her career with a DPhil in archaeology, but decided after voluntary work in various museums that her path lay down the route of conservation. She joined the museum in 2014, and recently completed her accreditation with the Institute of Conservation. To secure this status means going through an incredibly rigorous and challenging peer review process, which requires the conservator to, de de to demonstrate their competence, knowledge and judgment, and is held by fewer than a thousand people across the entire world. As well as uh, demonstrating these skills, today's talk looks more broadly at the process by which other museums can borrow and display elements of the Royal Armouries collection. Without any further ado then, let me hand you over, albeit in pre-recorded form, to Lauren Piper. So. other institutions and indeed this is a key aspect of the Royal Armoury's role as the National Museum of Arms and Armour. In my talk today I'd like to talk you through the process of museum loans but really looking at them from a conservation perspective and I'm also going to be using the case study of a loan of a Japanese armour which we did last year. We currently have over 2,100 objects out on loan to other museums and around the world really, so in 11 different countries. And then the Royal Armouries has over 1,400 objects that it's borrowed from other institutions and from private lenders. I've included a small section of our policy on this slide. And if you don't mind me reading, um, it says the Royal Armouries recognises both the national and international importance of its collection and the contribution it can make to the increase of knowledge and appreciation of arms and armour by lending. It goes on to say the Royal Armouries will endeavour to meet all requests for loans for public display from its collections subject to the conditions of loan, its own display requirements and the needs of the collection. So I'd like to just draw out two key points from that statement. Firstly, that there needs to be a public benefit to the loan. 
For example, it will give new audiences opportunities to see objects from the museum's collection. The objects may be interpreted in a new context or used to tell a particular story to the visitor. There's also the advantage that an object that might normally be kept in stores is brought out to enjoy its own moment of glory on display. And then when that object comes back to us at the end of a loan, it can help us to enrich and rethink our existing displays. But secondly, there are very strict parameters to the loans and certain conditions have to be met. These will depend on the specific display requirements of the object. And so how is this decided? At the Royal Armouries, we have a loans committee, and this is formed from members of a variety of different teams. And so there are members of the registrar's team who manage all outgoing and incoming loans. There are members of the curatorial team who can advise as to whether the objects requested are appropriate to the theme of the exhibition or suggest better alternatives. And they can also help with content development. As conservators, we can input on whether the object is stable enough for transport and display and whether it will need interventive treatment in order to make it ready for the process. We'll also comment on whether the environment that the borrower can provide is suitable for the object in question. And we might flag the potential presence of hazards such as radiation or asbestos that could impact on the feasibility of the loan. If the object requested is on display, members of the public engagement team can advise as to whether its removal will impact on the interpretation of the gallery or on educational events. And then display technicians can um, input on the amount of mount making that would be required. And that's something that they do in house. As a team as a whole, though, we also have to consider practicalities like capacity. Would the loan clash with our own in house exhibitions, for example, or with a particular project that's taking place? As a team, though, we'll make a recommendation, which then is passed on to the executive board and then to the Board of Trustees for final say. So from a conservation perspective, how does the process begin? We, like our colleagues in other teams, receive a loan assessment form. And I've included a screenshot of one of the pages uh, on this slide, as well as a close up view. Our section of the form identifies the object or objects requested, who buy, and also the proposed duration of the loan. And then as an objects conservator, I will physically go and assess the object or objects. And I'm specifically looking at how stable the object is based on its constituent materials. I'll need to specify whether the object will need interventive treatment prior to loan, and I'll need to state how long this would take and whether I'll require any additional materials or equipment. You can imagine transport and display put certain stresses on objects, but it varies very much by the object in question. So a machine gun will require very different care to a Japanese armor, for example. I'll also discuss um, requirements for mount making with the technicians. We work very closely as teams and I'll have to consider whether I can facilitate the work based on my current workload. If the object's currently on display, we'll also have to think about where, whether as a team, as a conservation team, we can facilitate work on a replacement object for the case. And this is something known as backfill. My colleague, Becky, our preventive conservator, has her own section of the form to complete. And this is where she'll specify the environmental parameters for display. 
based on its constituent materials, for example, what levels of visible and UV light should the object be displayed at? And what level of relative humidity? If an object has textile components, it will need to be displayed at very low light levels to avoid fading. And textiles, because they're organic, like human beings, prefer a mid-range level of RH, relative humidity. Too dry and they can become weak and brittle, um, but too damp and they risk developing mould. Whereas metals prefer a drier environment to reduce the risk of corrosion. At the armories, um, most of our objects, or many of them at least, are composites, so they combine um, inorganic elements like metal, with organic components made from textile, wood, leather, et cetera. And so environmental parameters for these objects are a balancing act, but in everything we're looking for stability. And if an object is particularly vulnerable, we might specify a shorter loan duration just to mitigate those risks. Once the loan has been agreed in principle, then the borrower has their own um, questionnaire and further paperwork to fill out. And this includes a security supplement. And that will review the security measures in place at the venue. It looks at things like um, case construction, so thickness of glass, locking mechanisms, as well as the presence or absence of security cameras and the degree of invigilation and then a separate section will look at the construction of space and the types of environmental conditions that they can provide at present, as well as asking whether the building is monitored for evidence of insect or rodent activity, for example. If Becky, our preventive conservator, isn't completely happy with the responses in this questionnaire, she can request um, several months worth of environmental data before making a final recommendation. So to allow you to better understand the loans process, I'm now going to introduce you to the case study. Um, and in 2019, we had a request from our local partner, Leeds Museums and Galleries, to borrow three objects for an exhibition entitled Making Japan, which is due to open at Lotherton Hall in March 2020. Following guidance from Royal Armouries curator Natasha Bennett, the objects requested were a 17th century sword or wakazashi, a 19th century Edo period a uh, matchlock musket or tepo, and an Edo period armor, Tose Gosoku. And of these objects, by far the most complex from a conservation and mounting perspective is the armor. It's um, a gold lacquered red laced example, believed to have been drawn together from older and newer components during the 19th century. The armor comprises 10 major components, which you can see on screen now. Um, and these are made from a really staggering range of materials. So in terms of metals, there's um, iron in the form of plate and mail, as well as gold, silver and copper alloy. And then we have lacquer, wood, uh, rawhide, leather, textile and even glass. I'm just going to talk you through each of those components now in slightly more detail. And the images that I'll be sharing with you next are pre-conservation treatment. So firstly, we have a helmet or kabuto. And this has a helmet bowl made of russet iron and comprising 26 um, plates, which are riveted together. It's fitted with a neck guard of gold lacquered rawhide plates connected by red lacing. And it's, um, and these plates, sorry, I should say, are backed with leather. And it also has sweeping turn backs, which have printed leather and silver edges. The helmet bowl is uh, lined with a cellulose based textile and leather, and its helmet cords, which are padded, retain traces of their white 
Chiraman silk um, uh, covering, and this is a kind of silk crepe. And then sitting above the peak of the helmet, you can see a fabulous uh, snarling shishi crest. This is a, a kind of lion dog guardian creature, and it's made from lacquered wood and has glass eyes. And next we have a face mask or mempo. Again, this has a russet iron finish, but with a vibrant red lacquered interior. And the mask is of the so-called old man style. So it has pronounced wrinkles and also a full moustache, side whiskers and beard made from white animal hair. And then attached to the bottom of the mask, there is a throat guard made from gold lacquered plates connected by red lacing. Next, we come to the body defense or dough. Um, which comprises a gold lacquered red lace cuirass in two halves, front and back, which are connected by a hinge under the left arm and tied under the right arm. The lanes or plates of the body armour are likely to be composites of rawhide and ferrous metal, um, partly for uh, weight, but also strength. And then it has a padded collar in what's known as Kiko work, where hexagonal metal plates would have been sandwiched between layers of textile. And this is edged with silk thread and, and gold thread. The dough also features seven tassets, which are these upper thigh defenses, um, again in gold lacquered scales connected by red laces. The arm defenses or cote are made from a coarse brown fabric with gold stenciling and the fabric resembles a rough cotton or hemp and then it's reinforced with black lacquered mail and gold lacquered plates intended to protect the forearms and hands. Each sleeve is then edged with green and red braid and fine red piping. There's also a pair of shoulder guards or sauté. These feature seven rows of gold lacquered scales connected by red lacing and each shoulder guard is backed with smoked leather and textile. There's a pair of thigh defences or high date and these take the form of a large apron. So the image on the right, top right of the screen here, the thigh defences are folded back on themselves. Again, these use the coarse brown stencil cloth, and then there are two panels of gold lacquered red lace scales. And the thigh guards would have been tied at the waist with this band of uh, pale blue green chiraman silk. And then finally, we have a pair of shin guards of suniete. Again, these feature the brown stencil cloth, but also punched um, gold uh, leather and black lacquered mail. And then we have Kiko work sections, much like the collar on the body defense. Prior to being requested uh, for loan, the armor wasn't on display. It was actually um, mostly boxed in terms of its individual components and kept in one of our stores with only the torso section being kept on a mount. Condition-wise, there were a number of issues and the armour was in need of significant intervention if it were to be able to withstand travelling even the relatively short distance to Lobberton Hall. The textile elements in particular were extremely fragile. I've just mentioned that a number of components of the armour feature a kind of crepe silk known as chiraman silk. And silks are particularly prone to degradation. Um, so the helmet cords and the ties on the thigh defenses and the shin guards um, were all beginning to fray, disintegrate and shed fibers. There were holes as well in many of the backing fabrics, such as in the coarse brown cloth. And then the red edging piping um, on many of the components was beginning to come loose or come away completely. So you can see that here on 
the Kiko collar and on the arm guards. In terms of the lacquer, the lacquer itself was cracked and in some places crumbling or lost completely. Um, for those who don't know, Japanese lacquer is made from the sap from a particular genus of tree um, and the active ingredient is called arushiol. And it's the polymerization of the arushiol that forms lacquer or arushi. The process of lacquering involves the building up of a series of layers on a substrate, such as iron or wood or rawhide. And in the ground layers, the lacquer can be combined with fillers, such as clay or powdered stone. And then as you get to the upper layers, it can be mixed with pigments or um, obviously metallic powders or leaf. Lacquer is initially extremely stable. Um, but its long-term stability is affected by the environment in which it's kept. Exposure to light causes lacquer to become dull and faded. And this is because the energy of the light breaks the molecular bonds in the arushiol polymer, which results in a, a kind of series of micro cracks. These in turn make the lacquer more vulnerable to water damage. And this degradation is unfortunately um, irreversible. If you look, if you compare the black lacquer on the shoulder straps with that on the underside of the throat guard, so an area which would not have been exposed to light, um, you can really see the difference in terms of the depth of shade and the degree of shine. And I'd also point out the difference between the red lacing on the area shaded from light when compared to the red lacing on the Kiko collar. Structural deterioration of lacquer can also result from the differing responses of the substrate to the overlying lacquer. Um, so for example, if we think again of this shoulder strap, the ferrous metal substrate when exposed to fluctuating relative humidity will not react in the same way as the overlying lacquer layers. And this creates stresses which lead to the kind of cracks and losses that we see, particularly when exacerbated by mechanical damage such as NOx. An additional problem for the armour was that the mount wasn't fully fit for purpose. Um, the body defence was kept on a traditional cedar wood mount, rather like the example shown on the slide, um, supplemented with a moulded fibreglass core. But over time, the armour had begun to slump slightly and the weight of the unsupported tacit plates was putting a lot of stress and strain on the red lacing, which was already weakened by exposure to light in the past. Following discussion with the display technicians and with my conservation colleagues, we estimated that the entire treatment and remounting would take at least three weeks of solid work. Um, and my colleague Becky stressed that the armour would need really strict environmental display parameters. And yet none of these potential strikes against the feasibility of the loan were insurmountable. We had the capacity and it's not often that a conservator gets the justification to work on such a complex in-depth treatment like this one. So the loan was officially approved and the treatment could begin. Definitely the most time consuming work in this conservation treatment was the dyeing and application of support fabrics for vulnerable textiles. Um, for the Chiraman silk, I um, dyed conservation grade nylon net with um, conservation safe specialist dyes, which are designed to be color fast. And this dyed net was then used in case the damaged components. For the armor, I had to achieve two good color matches. So um, an off-white buff shade for the helmet cords, and then a pale blue green for the side guard ties and the shin guard ties. Wherever possible, the net was wrapped around the original textile and then stitched to itself rather than to the actual object. Um, it's a reversible treatment. 
it's very good because you can still see the original material inside um, and yet it's reducing further fiber loss and deterioration. So here are just a couple of before and after shots. So we have the ties on one of the shin guards and also the helmet cords before and after being encased in the netting. The holes in the um, base layer fabrics, such as the stencil brown textile, were repaired by a stitching technique known as couching, which allows the layers of fabric to lie uh, really flush against each other. And then the loose edging braids were repositioned and carefully secured in position with discrete stitching. So here is a before and after. You can see that red piping has been put back into place, same with the arm guard here. Another aspect of the treatment was the consolidation of cracks in lacquer and the filling of the most vulnerable areas of loss. It's not necessary, I want to stress, or ethical to try to completely fill areas of loss. Um, our intention as conservators is not to try to restore the armor to make it look like new. Instead, it's to stabilize the object and to stop or at least to slow any further deterioration. So a solution of a thermoplastic resin called Paraloid B72 was made up with toluene as a solvent. And this was injected into the cracks using um, a micro syringe to stabilize the edges. And then that same resin was mixed with glass micro balloons to form a paste for filling some of the areas of loss. I've highlighted with a yellow box on the left, some of those really vulnerable losses. You can see in the center then the paste has been applied. And then this was toned in with acrylic paints to make it less visually obtrusive. In other instances, old fills that had been done in the past were also toned in. So here we have a gray fill on the shishi crest and then on the right that's been impainted to make it less obvious. And then the armor mount was adapted with the help of our display technicians, Johnny and Giles, and also my conservation colleague, Jamie. Firstly, the fiberglass core was adjusted to make it fit better and provide more support. And then Johnny made individual acrylic mounts for each of the tassets, which was screwed into the main torso mount and the tassets secured with fishing wire. Technician Giles also made steel armatures, um, which I wrapped in wadding and inert fabric to take the weight of the arm guards. You can imagine with all that mail and plate, they're really quite, quite heavy. And Giles also made a separate steel mount with two uprights to which we attached inert plastic foam. And then I carved this foam, um, look horribly like kebabs, but actually to make leg-like cores. And then the shin guards could be wrapped around these, gently tied and supported with entomological pins. And here are just some uh, images of the final armor. Um, we tend to go for photography when a, a treatment's finished, particularly if it's going on loan. And as is standard practice, the treatment was fully documented on our collections database, um, EMU. This um, provides a really good object treatment history, and also it can be used as a reference point in future because we include detailed before and after shots and also methodology and um, information about products used. Conservation work done, the next crucial stage in the loans process is to create an accurate record of the object's condition before it leaves the museum. So there's a screenshot here of one of the pages from the condition report of the MEMPO. This document will be reviewed with the borrower and it will be signed and dated by both parties. So it serves um, 
as a way to keep track of any changes that might occur during the period of the loan. And then for longer term loans, so those with a duration of three years or more, it's a really crucial reference point for annual checks or on-site loan inspections. You can see that the condition report includes detailed photographs um, of different aspects of the object. And these are annotated um, to indicate pre-existing issues and also potential areas of concern. Once the object's been conserved and condition reported, the next stage is for it to be packed. There's no one size fits all approach to packing arms and armor or to objects more generally. For the Japanese armor, we decided it would be best to try and transport the armor in a partially assembled state rather than disassembling it into its individual components. Each time you disassemble and reassemble an armor, you're putting it at risk. So this was a way to reduce that risk and also obviously makes installation at the venue more straightforward. So the body armor, arm guards and shoulder guards were kept together on the mount, but we used strips of Tyvek, which is a breathable polyethylene fabric to, um, to go between the components. So to, can, to cushion them against um, vibration and movement during transit. Thus wrapped, the armour was further secured with acid-free cotton tape and then fixed into a crate using wooden batons. And you can just about make out there's some um, blocks of inert plastic foam underneath those upper thigh guards just to really minimise movement and vibration. The remaining parts of the armour were then individually packed into acid-free uh, cardboard boxes with acid-free tissue. Um, all of the materials that we use for packing uh, arms and armour have been tested and found to be safe to be in contact with the objects. When deciding how to pack a loan, you have to do quite a lot of second guessing. It might sound ridiculous to say, will the crate fit through the front door? But actually, if you have a large crate and historic property, this can be an issue. If the exhibition space isn't on the ground floor, as is the case at Lotherton, you also have to reckon for um, the dimension of lifts. That's if they exist at all. And you have to think about narrow corridors and tight bends. When we send our objects out on loan, they're nearly always accompanied by one or more couriers. And that's whether the object is going to Australia or just down the road. The courier and the shipping agent must keep track of the cargo at all times and not lead, leave the, um, the objects unattended. So this can lead to some quite long stints at airport security. For the Lobberton loan, um, the transport aspect was obviously more straightforward. It involved myself and technician Johnny accompanying the crate on a tail lift van. But even such a short journey can still represent a risk, particularly to a fragile object like a Japanese armor, which is why proper packing is so crucial to minimize vibration, as well as wherever possible using a van with air ride suspension. Once the um, objects have arrived safely at the venue, the courier or couriers will unpack them and check them over. And to do this, we use the condition report that I mentioned before. Um, we go through this with a member from the borrowing institution um, before signing and dating. And the same process is repeated at the other end of the loan before repacking. So here's just some images of the exhibition space. Um, following those loan checks, Johnny and I were able to install the armor here in the far corner, as well as the matchlock musket and the sword. And then prior to closing the case, we inserted a, um, a data logger to monitor the environment going forward. And a handheld light monitor was used just to check 
that the conditions were suitable for the armour. Once a loan has gone out and been installed, you might think that the work stops there, but unfortunately or fortunately not. Our preventive conservator receives um, and reviews environmental readings for our many loans on a regular basis. And for longer term loans, the registrar's department also arranged periodic loan inspections where we can go and look at the condition of the objects prior to approving any renewals or extensions. But the loans process is overwhelmingly a positive one. Um, it means that a relationship is established between institutions and networks grow. And then at your own institution, obviously, it involves a huge amount of, of teamwork. So it's a very positive experience. Sadly, of course, the Lobberton exhibition wasn't open for very long at all before the hall was forced to close its doors due to COVID-19. That being said, it is possible to explore its content via an excellent online exhibition. I've included the link here on the screen. And Leeds Museums and Galleries have continued to provide us with environmental data um, for the duration. The global pandemic has had a really dramatic impact on the loans programmes of all museums. Um, many loans have been cancelled as the exhibitions that they were intended to complement have been postponed or even mothballed completely. But equally, um, there have also been some really creative responses, such as digital exhibitions, but also when it's not been possible to um, to courier an object in person, um, the use of live video links has really helped in that objects can be installed and deinstalled under the virtual supervision of the lending institution. Sometimes this can be made quite challenging by time difference, but it's insurmount it's not insurmountable, obviously. Um, and as we hopefully move forward into a post-pandemic world, it will be really interesting to see which of these adaptations are set to one side and which have actually been found to be very efficient and become more or less standard practice. So thank you very much for listening. I'll stop share now. Um, thank you very much. Okay, now comes the moment of truth. Hello, Lauren, are you with us? Hi, I should be. Giant finger there. Sorry, Mark. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's no problem. Um, yeah. Thank you for an absolutely fascinating uh, lecture. I, I, I don't think people often get the, the opportunity to appreciate just how much hard work goes into, you know, goes on in the background, keeping the, the stuff that we have as pristine as it is. I guess just, just for perspective, you mentioned, I think, uh, 2,500 objects on loan and 50, sort of 1,500 on loan to us. Roughly how large is the collection and how much of it is on show at any particular time? Okay, so roughly we've got about 75,000 objects in the collection. Um, that doesn't include archives or um, special collections items but just broadly speaking, and about 12% is actually on display. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's quite a small proportion, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, so I guess we're out there actively looking for, for people to take stuff off our hands, really. But is there, <laughs> is there anything, you know, you, you mentioned it obviously has to have, have merit, have a, a, a heritage merit in terms of, you know, new light it'll shed on the objects. Is there anything that we wouldn't ever consider sending out? There isn't a kind of um, object blacklist. So mm -hmm. things that cannot go out, definitely. Um, it's very much a risk assessment. So each time you would go to the object and, and check. And the same object might be suitable for lending one year. Mm -hmm. And then a few years down the line, it might not be. So, yeah. Case by case. Um, but some objects do have to have um, special additional permission, actually, royal permission. So there are all kinds of interesting things going on. <laughs> and, you know, you mentioned that sometimes things going out gives us a new way of, of looking at an object. Is there any way you think its time alone has been particularly insightful? Um, 
Obviously, sometimes you can find something which is really interesting from a, a scholarship perspective. But every time I find every time I work on an object, it's more about personal insights. And so, for example, if you're disassembling a firearm, you might um, come across maker's marks or things that nobody else has really seen. So that's interesting. Um, also, I worked on a buff coat for loan once and I hadn't known very much about them. And that showed me that the lacing down the sides of the buff coat, um, it, it was just for show, more or less. Um, and actually, there were traces of hooks and eyes inside the coat. So, yeah, you do get insights all the time. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, we had a question from Pete about can you put the lower web link to the Lotherton Hall exhibition. So I think I've put it. If you can't, if if people can't see it in the answer thing, let me know and I'll I'll put it in the chat. I think, but. Uh, sorry, so, so just to carry on. So this this sort of uh, in-depth, hands-on experience of objects, obviously, uh, I suppose, quite a quite a daunting thing to do. In terms of your your own experience, has, has has there ever been an object that you felt starstruck when when working on? Um, I haven't been at the armories long at all, actually. When um, the Tonlet armor, Henry VIII's Tonlet mm -hmm. armor, came back from loan. <laughs> So that was an eye opener and that felt hugely exciting. Um, but to be honest, any object links you to the person who created it and who um, and people who've cared for it in the past as well. So my predecessors, uh, it's and I find with armour in particular, because you have that physical representation of the human body, it's really exciting to think about who might have worn, worn the armour. So most objects leave me a little starstruck. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's something that keeps you coming in on a Monday morning, though, isn't it? The prospect of, of working with something so special. Oh, definitely. Now, now I know you obviously you had a, a professional qualification as a as a conservator before you came to the armories, and you've done your accreditation since, but. Before sort of starting with objects, how much you know? How much book learning do you do versus how much kind of on-the-job training and practice, looking at other people's notes, that sort of thing? In terms of um, studies, or when I'm about to work on an object in work, I was thinking, do they just you know when you're first coming in as a very junior conservator, how hands-on are the people supervising you, or do they just give you something fairly minor and let you go to town? <laughs> Um, my student placement, I seem to remember my first object was a, um, a mammoth tusk, mm -hmm. <laughs> which needed some consolidation. Um, to gain confidence, I think you have to be given a certain amount of trust, um, but you're kept quite a close eye on subtly. <laughs> um, and you obviously have to constantly be doing book learning and talking to people to supplement that, that information, I think. Yeah. Uh, so a, a, a practical question from uh, from Barry Duncan. Uh, the costs of any required conservation prior to loans, either in full or in part, are they generally covered by the receiving institution, or is it something that we we handle almost as a as a as a I guess well, not not a present to them because it's work we need to do. But it depends on the nature of the loan. Um, so there is an agreement in place between national museums where costs are covered generally um, mm -hmm. only kind of direct costs are, are covered um, I would have to defer to a colleague in the registrar's team to give a definitive answer mm -hmm. um, but yes it very much depends sometimes the borrower will cover the costs of transport for example conservators time and materials um, but other institutions um, we kind of cover it in-house more or less yeah. And of course, conservation isn't just something that we, we do as part of loans. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. We had a question from uh, Miyuki, which is objects in store. How often do they tend to be either cleaned or checked? Well, checks are going on constantly. Um, informal checks, I would say. And then we do periodic audits of the condition of, of store items. But you can imagine with a collection of the size that we have and the team is relatively small. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is needs must and as things mm -hmm. come up a bit more ad hoc. Um, but there are always eyes in the store in terms of also the curators are in there and they will 
um, submit object requests if they come across an object that needs particular help. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> obviously. We, we, there seems to be a trend for people asking questions about disaster scenarios, so we'll, we'll get them out, uh, <laughs> out of the way now. So I had a, a question. If the loan object is found damaged after it arrives with the lending party, so I presume in transit, how would we deal with the responsibility? Would we talk through emergency conservation on site? Would it still be loaned or would we take it back? I think it would depend on the degree of damage. So certain things could be kind of triaged. At, at the venue, um, you would have to look at what had gone wrong and mm -hmm. review so that that wouldn't happen again. And I think it would involve um, in-depth conversation with the shipping agent, trying to figure out exactly what's gone wrong. Um, mm -hmm. But then we would obviously have to make the judgment call of do we continue with the loan or not. But um, thankfully, it's not something that's happened uh, to me or to, to anyone I know yet. <laughs> I was going to say, and from an internal perspective as well, we want we, we would want to know what happens so we can stop it from happening again because we do these loans fairly frequently. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and a report would need to be written and lessons learned, essentially. So. Yeah. Okay. Some some fairly technical questions, which I will I will pass on entirely as they're, they're, uh, they're given because they're way beyond my pay grade. Uh, so is, is degree level training in chemistry or metallurgy needed when becoming a conservator? Um, no, though. Um, so for me, when I did my conservation training, I did my master's at Durham um, mm -hmm. University. I needed to, thankfully, I'd done chemistry A level. So that was um, sufficient for me. But um, you can also do a online chemistry for conservators course which is quite good to give you that bridging information at the time that was a requirement um, metallurgy is obviously a really useful um, skill we do quite a lot of um, work on the chemistry of metals as part of the the studies um, but a lot of conservators do then go along to take um, extra courses in metallurgy or um, informal training so and also metalworking mm -hmm. skills are very useful. And, and yeah. leading on quite nicely from that. I'm oh, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I'm lagging, unfortunately. We, we, we thought your internet connection was going to be the problem, but uh, we had a question from Chris Allen, which was uh, exposed rusted steel like that on the shoulder braces. How might you go about treating that? Um, so if it's accessible and you're not going to risk damaging the lacquer, um, I would tend to use some, a tool that we have called um, a glass bristle brush, um, which has a head of compacted uh, glass fibres or a very um, low grade. We have a, a type of wire wool, essentially, which is um, quadruple zero grade, um, and that can be used to just mildly abrade the uh, active corrosion. And then after that, we would probably treat it with um, just a coating like a microcrystalline wax. Good. And a, a question from Diana Foster about uh, treatment reversibility. Could you expand on that a little, such as the injection of the B72 solution you mentioned? Its reversal seems it would be very complex as it was injected. So. Yes. Yeah, there is a degree of, um, <laughs> how can I put it? Um, reversibility is definitely on a sliding scale. So in an ideal world, because the B72 is within a solvent carrier, you could use that solvent to remove it. In practice, that will be quite challenging. Um, so there's a balance between full reversibility and something that will benefit and stabilize the object being as reversible as you can make it. Um, yeah, perhaps not a very satisfactory answer, but not everything can be completely reversible. It's just as reversible as we as we can. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, again, on, on a similar topic, a question from Peter. Apart from fabrics, what gives what gives the most problem or tends to? Oh, um, that's an interesting question. Mm, certainly leather can be very problematic as well. So organic material tends to be um, tends to be the most challenging. Um, 
And then it's made more complex when you, you have a composite object because of that interaction between the different materials. Um, that being said, it, it depends on the environment that something's been kept in. So metals can be equally challenging if they've, uh, if they've been subjected to a fluctuating environment. Yeah, so I guess it's it, it's all in what the object is, how much it needs, rather than necessarily the, the materials, because presumably metal objects can be just as much of a nightmare. Oh, definitely, yes. <laughs> definitely. Good. Uh, another, another practical question before we move on to something uh, slightly more general. Uh, why did you decide on toluene instead of acetone for the B72? So. Oh, um, well, toluene, um, it's an aromatic hydrocarbon. It is, we normally mix our B72 <laughs> with acetone, <laughs> um, but toluene is less volatile. So basically what that means in layman's terms is it gives you more workability time with your adhesive. So um, it's not going to evaporate immediately. It gives you time to um, position things. It also, we found the toluene doesn't soften the lacquer. Um, so it's a good pairing. Okay, thank you. And, and hastily dragging you back to some sort of things I can understand. Do you have any advice for current conservation students studying in the pandemic? Because obviously, you know, your, your amount of time with the, the collection has been extremely limited. So for those who are on their way up, any advice that you could give them? It's very difficult at the minute, I think, because obviously, if you don't have much classroom time and contact time, building up those practical skills it's very hard. I would suggest taking advantage of um, all of the free online training that's available. Um, I would also suggest um, if you can build on any craft skills at home, such as stitching, such as working on your own pieces, um, just build up a practical portfolio in the best way you can, I would suggest. And, and yes, take, take advantage of as much as con of contacts as well, you know, contact people at institutions, pick their brains. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a really, really tough time for people, though, because I know how important my time in the lab was and is. Great. And we had a sort of related question from uh, an anonymous attendee, which is what kind of issues have you come across working with objects during the pandemic? Um, she access time to the collection makes it difficult as does having to go in on your own because so much of our work is you know involves teamwork um you can imagine just getting an armor off display you can't do it on your own safely um so that's been challenging but in some ways as conservators we were quite well prepped for um pandemic protocols because we always wear gloves anyway when handling things and think very much about not transferring um, acid from, from fingerprints etc to, to objects so it, it's just made it hard in, in terms of yeah not being able to to do the job I love <laughs> as often but um, yeah yeah I mean I guess in, in 10 years because stuff like making mounts must be such a, a practical element that until I guess maybe 3D printing and, and VR until you've got that ability to, to look at them and, and discuss them in that way, it's going to be almost impossible. Yes, it is very challenging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you just need to be there with the objects. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, a, a question from Robbie through the chat. Uh, when working on objects so closely, do you ever, mind, do you ever find finger marks, scratches, mistakes, or any old marks of armors and smiths who worked on the object in the past? Oh, definitely. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, you find corroded uh, fingerprints quite often. So I would encourage people. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's why we say to always wear gloves uh, when touching metal objects. <laughs> um, a good example of mistakes is the um, there's a panel on the skirt of the Tonlet armour um, where the person engraving has obviously picked the wrong uh, area to start and then hastily abandoned it so you have a kind of partial pattern um, but yeah we find tooling marks all the time and um, and evidence of scratches both um, historic and unfortunately more modern. <laughs> mm -hmm. now, we, we have a, uh, there's a there's a researcher who's working with the armories at the minute who's interested in uh, symbolism and, and marks effectively but you, you've recommended uh, 
armor plates moving against one another often creates uh, marks that they'll find interesting. But of course, that's only something that you'll see when the armor's disassembled and taken apart. Definitely, because it's that movement of the armor lanes against each other. It just um, it polishes the surface effectively. So you see the wear marks from um, how the pieces of armor move over each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very it's a very privileged uh, perspective. It is. <laughs> uh, so a, another practical question from Casper: Has the relatively new technique of laser ablation cleaning micro shockwaves removing rust been used on metals in the Royal Armouries? Um. Well, I have done laser training way back in the past, but we haven't used it since I've been there. Um, it would be very interesting to hire some kit and, and have a try and see the potential at some point. But um, yes, <laughs> one of the few. Yeah, maybe, maybe someday when everything's uh, more <laughs> back to normal. And a, 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 a slightly technical question from Stuart. You mentioned the roles of registrars when deciding what items can be loaned. Uh, how closely do you collaborate with the registrar team through the entire process? Very closely. Yeah, very closely. All of the teams are in, in very regular contact um, in normal times, so to speak. The meetings were monthly, but emails are flying backwards and forwards. Um, and we kind of uh, coordinate on everything right the way through the process. And. Um, those are all the sort of major questions we had from the audience, but but I had one. It's possibly too early to tell, but in the future, do you think the, there's going to be much more market for loans as institutions want to put on stuff, but are maybe restricted, or are the difficulties post pandemic going to continue and, and restrict our ability to to collaborate in that way? It's really difficult to say, to be honest. Um, we're still getting loan requests coming in at the minute, um, so there is still. An appetite for it. Um, the practicalities though become very difficult and actually there's a panel discussion coming up, um, I'd have to let you know the, the exact details <laughs> about um, what's going to happen in terms of couriering of loans because there's obviously cost saving to not sending a courier as well as a health and safety aspect and an environmental benefit potentially too. So um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see where that one goes. I hope that um, we'll get back to, to the, the date of the big travelling exhibition again. <laughs> I was going to say, but no matter what, you'll still be having to work hard on conservation, even if it's not loan objects, it's still our own internal stuff that needs doing. So. Definitely. <laughs> but that's absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much, Lauren, for taking time out of your day to uh, come speak to us. And I was going to say, if, if people have any object-specific questions, any questions about the process of conservation, or anything else we weren't able to cover today you still like an answer to, then inquiries at armories.org.uk will get you in touch with one of the collections team or you know di directly to, to Lauren to answer it. So. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you. So thank you also to Robbie for producing the event behind the scenes and to you, the audience, for taking time out of your day to attend and for all the questions you had for our speaker. So our next event will take place in two weeks' time on Thursday the 4th of March when the Museum's Archives and Records Manager, Philip Abbott, will draw on some of the written sources in the museum's collection, the, the stuff that Lauren uh, mentioned, as not, count, not necessarily counting as objects, but still important nevertheless. Uh, he'll draw on these sources to explore the life and career of Captain William Dawson in the Napoleonic Royal Navy. Unfortunately, this event isn't yet listed on the website. Normally, we try to have them up before the next talk, but in this case, we've had a bit of admin difficulty. However, you can follow us on Eventbrite to be noticed when the, notified when the talk goes live, or you can just keep an eye on our webpage, which is royalarmies.org. In the meantime, thank you again for spending time with us today, and I look forward to seeing you in two weeks' time. <laughs>